thank you for joining us for yet another brand new episode of Making Conversations Count with me, Wendy Harris, your host and expert telemarketing trainer. In today's conversation, we're going to be making conversations about Book it, Count. Book it, you say, Wendy. Well, but first, what's new, Wendy Wu? Well, last time I asked if you really enjoyed the show, that you would leave us a review because those reviews help the sites just push out our podcast to more listeners that might find it interesting. So I have a big thank you shout out to Focus CEO via the Apple podcast site for a five star review. It's simple. I love it. It simply says insightful, great format, a ton of value. Keep rocking. Well, Focus CEO, for you, we're going to keep rocking. Today's guest expert understands funnels very well. There are funnels on CRMs, through the sales process, in marketing and operations. Practically every department will have a funnel to measure input versus output. So why a book it? Well, it's a culmination of Barnaby's career through advertising and branding and how he holds on to the elements he needs to help businesses create a brilliant brand. Barnaby also shares with us his bookshelf and he's read them all. I know you'll hear me ask. And his recommendations, including seven habits of highly successful people. And a sound brand is underpinned by a value proposition, but perhaps not in the way that you currently think of that. So Barnaby explains the four B's that build this before you start to understand your ideal client. Our ideals on branding are challenged in this conversation, but as with all good questioning, will make you stop, think and potentially alter your course of action. Let's get back to making conversations about book it count. I've got two questions. Have you read all of those books behind you? I have. And isn't it a sacrilege to have them lying down like that? I'm, I'm sure that there are people that will be twitching, you know, like what's its face on Strictly does on a Saturday night. <laughs> and Tony twitches, doesn't he? Because it's not quite right. Well, it, when you say it's not quite right, it is my considered view that it enables me to read the spines very clearly. Mm. Whereas when they're on their side, I, I can't read them so clearly. So, So I'm not sure... I agree with you. I think all books should be stacked like this. I may just have to a, a bit of a challenge on my hand as, as well. Then you, know. <laughs> you can um, get a, you can get more books in, so that, that you can see the shelves sort of bend much much more vigorously when you have them stacked like this. And also, you can just read them very quickly and go, "Yeah, there's that one there, and then this one here, and that one there." And you know, are you inclined so. to pull them out and read from X because you know what's inside the book? Are you inclined then to sort of pull them out? for reference points quicker no (laughs) (laughs) i thought you were gonna be i thought it was gonna be really clever then once i've read them they go there and then to be fair i have to be really honest with you so all of these that you can see Mm. i've read from cover to cover and probably base a lot of my thinking on as you get further up so i've started all the others but i didn't necessarily finish them because they weren't really particularly didn't quite make the grade no, they weren't really didn't really resonate with me. So then that that's a challenge, if so as I mean. So mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. isn't it isn't it strange? I've got books in the loft that I've had oh, about 30 years. And you know, I've put them in a in a box and they're all nicely protected and everything, so that the Mises can't get them. But yeah. Every time I go up there, every now and again, an odd book that I may have started years and years and years ago. I've gone, oh, I'll try that again. And I've been ready for it. It's it's strange how books have those sort of odd yes. cycles. So I think you're right in the sense that every now and then I have a I'm with you on that. I have a moment where suddenly where suddenly I think, oh, actually you're right. I, I need to I need to do something with that or refer refer to that. But it's very, very unusual. 
Mm. Um, for me to have to do that normally because I'm, you know, but so I'm, I sometimes I re read books. I'm just reading this one, Contagious. I don't know if you why things catch on. So I'm just on the way yeah. back through that. I, I think I might have that on my bookshelf. Yeah, well, there you go. So <laughs> it certainly rings a bell. But th- th- there's always a go-to book, isn't there? That you know. Oh yeah, no, I've, I've got dozens of those, dozens of those. Yeah. So these these are probably my go-to books. So challenge of customer, challenge of sale, CEO tours, purple cows, thinking fast and slow, uh, new edition of the Black History book, sometimes it's hard to lead startup, e myth. They're all go-to books for me. So when whenever people say you know got all these books, which one should I read? I go, well, what do you want to learn? And then they go, oh, uh, oh, and I go, well, yeah, you've got to start there. Otherwise, I'll just give you a list of books with no use to anybody. Yeah, because they've got to come to you at the right time in your journey, haven't they? I you- think that's right. But I've, I've always got a book or two books on, on the go at any given time. And I only read business books. Now. That's interesting because I read Atlas Shrugged, and it is a novel. And I think right. by a lady called Anne Rand. And mm-hmm. it's I- about... 1800 pages. Yeah, so I've got that Fountainhead that's here. I've not read Fountainhead, but the oh, Atlas Shrugged, it's, it's all about the railroad. And right, in okay, fact, so. it's a novel, but it is very commercially and it politically is. written. A brilliant writer. So I've got the Fountainhead and I've got another one, Thunder, which I've also read. But the Fountainhead is the one that I was told to go to, which is about an architect. I needed to know about that today because I'm looking into that. It's a thing. <laughs> so the question begs then, Barnaby, your own book. That's book one. The brand book it. Book two is here. Oh, transcripts. Oh. I've just got to the first draft, which I'm very happy with. And so that's there for uh, consuming and reading as a book rather than as bits I've written. So that's book two, which I, I'm going to try to get out at some stage in the next next few months, I think, somewhere. I haven't decided how yet, but uh, I just need to sit down. That will take care of itself when it's ready. So tell us about Brand Bucket. So this book really outlines what the Brand Bucket is all about. And it it is essentially how the Brand Bucket works, how you can apply it to your business. One of my Um, favourite beers on the cover. Chewbug or Carlsberg, which one? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. so it was used to launch Chewbug originally many years ago. And so it's a great way of shaping your approach to you know, the way you you turn your business to become marketing led and build a system and a process throughout your business which allows your business to ensure that everything you do is focused on the buyer so that's what that book's about I mean some people pick it up and they literally like well, one person came up to a networking event and he said he, had, he was carrying two effectively and he said this is the one you've written and then this is me going page by page through my business and he'd written the equivalent for his whole his whole business so it had impacted him a lot and a lot of people read it it's a great to be honest when it's a great business card you know marketing people are ten a penny and and so you say i'm in marketing and they go all right what do you do or so i help brands become famous and they go great and then they go and i've written a book and they go oh <laughs> and it completely changes the attitude towards you if you've written a book and then people read the book and then they come back and say, okay, now we know what to do. How do we go about it? And then, so the second book is much more about how you go about it, how in a modern day, that book was really created 10 years ago. And although strategically it's still very sound, actually the application of it has changed over the last 10 years. So it's the certainly book moved on more about the application. Yeah, yeah. Technology, social platforms, all of those things have really impacted, haven't they? You know, very much so. Yeah. I know certainly for myself, I concentrated on LinkedIn as a social platform, but I need to be in other places because I'm doing other things now. Yeah, so, yeah, you don't just have to be good at what you do. You have to be good at telling everybody about it as well, don't you? I think that's right. And I think, do you know what? It's not a tell thing anymore. I think this is where I'm trying to re-educate those that I come in contact with you're not in the business of telling your story anymore. And I think the digital knowledge economy has fundamentally changed all that. And I think that's what has happened over the last 10 years. We've moved from a a tell environment to an invite explanation environment. And that's strategically very different from what I was certainly taught 30 years ago when I came into the advertising industry, which was all about broadcast, broadcast. It's now about marshalling people inbound. So it's a very different, a different approach now. And I think that's where 
the businesses that are doing well have got that and the ones that aren't doing well just are still in tell mode and we're all going, no, 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 please don't tell us anymore. We've had enough. We don't want to listen. And we just switch off. Whereas I think once you strategically understand that the way we buy now has fundamentally changed, then you need to build the journey into your business in an entirely different way. And that's what I do with my clients right now with huge success. So, uh, so it's great. And it is, it's that conversation that we need to be having with clients, isn't it? And I think yeah. it doesn't matter what form of marketing you're in. And there are lots of people in marketing, in sales, in operations, in facilities. It really doesn't matter what department you're in anymore. You're still representing the brand and the business, aren't you? And the, the culture of that. So it Very has, so. has to be right. telling all the way th through you know, no matter who it is that's your touch point. Yes. As I said, I, th I think it's less about telling, but it's about engaging and, and demonstrating and delivering. I think that's really where there's a big difference now. I think if you go into tell mode, then you will just put people off. The journey is much more about the buyer now than it is about the brand owner. So what you've got to do is orientate your business so that it marshals the buyer towards your business rather than you tell them anything. I mean, clearly if they you have to answer questions and things like that. So I have to give them an answer. But as another book favorite is they ask the you answer. In that's a, right. Yes. You yeah. know, that what it is that you're putting out there can answer as many questions as possible. So that there's that they're running out of questions other than how can they work with you? Exactly. Yeah. So that that's certainly one of the the changes, although that's I think that again, that's changed in a much more modern day now. So I think there are some big, big breakthrough pieces of thinking that are in the, some of the books we can buy now to help businesses become much stronger brands in the marketplace. What's the one thing that anybody starting out in business could really benefit from answering for themselves when it comes to brand? Because it is such a big topic. And like we mentioned already, you know, we, we've got to be good at what it is that, that we do. What would be the best way to represent that as a brand in today's world? The key foundation stone that every aspiring business that wants to be a brand has to have in place is what we call a value proposition in the sense that they must have a working tool which allows them to tell the story at every opportunity. And when we talk about a value proposition at the Brand Bucket Company, we mean something entirely different to what most people refer to, which is often a highly crafted three-sentence paragraph that's done by somebody very clever and wordsmith, and that's kind of the value proposition. That is not what we mean by a value proposition. The value proposition we talk about is a tool which blends really four sets of values. The first set of values are what's your behavioral style. They all begin with B. What's your behavioral style? So you have to define what your behavioral style is as a brand because we buy from people we like. So what you need to define is what your behavioral style is, because then you're going to appeal to people who are, who are like you and, and you're like them. So that's the first thing you must define, that set of values. The second set of values you have to define is how you benefit the buyer. And again, a lot of people blast out features about their business, how they might, be, uh, they might think they're unique, how they might think they're different, but actually, in reality, what you should be communicating is all of the benefits rather than the features. And so how you make a difference to people's lives based on, us, on the features. Can you give us an example of, because of, I know features and benefits is something that I teach and people really struggle with separating the two out. So yeah. go back to my favourite beer, Tuborg. I'm looking for some sponsorship, sneakily. <laughs> I remember having to get the uh, the caps off the bottles and you'd get 10 caps for a T-shirt. We yes. have tons of t-shirts, but the features and benefits, if it was beer, what would the feature be versus the benefit to be able to sort of give a clear separation of that? So there was a very famous beer, which was slightly less gassy with no aftertaste. I don't know if you remember it. Was, I think it was called Rolling Rock and uh, was launched on a slightly less gassy with no aftertaste. The benefit clearly didn't appeal to me or make any No, difference. exactly. Because that's completely feature-based. Yeah, yes. that's a feature-based thing. Now, what their marketing was telling them is people didn't like lagers that were really gassy and everything. So they were trying to reduce the gas so they were more like bitters, which don't really have any gas in. And also, uh, a bitter lives its name, of course. So the, the implication was that if it was more like a, a, a beer than it was a lager, 
then it might be more bitter. So that's why it had, to, it had no aftertaste. So what they were addressing there was this kind of idea that people were out there worrying about fizzy lagers that had a bit of a, a backbite on the taste. In reality, when I launched a, a Red Stripe Lager, and the benefit of drinking Red Stripe Lager is that you were drinking a piece of Jamaica. And so therefore, what the spirit around the, the beer was much more about actually you're participating in the spirit and the life of Jamaica. So Red Stripe is a Jamaican beer. And so therefore, what we were able to do strategically is, is, is turn it into a well-recognized Jamaican beer. So what the benefit was that if you were seen with a Red Stripe lager, you identified with the spirit of Jamaica. And that's the benefit. So actually then what it did is really played on the style side, which I was the, the behavioral characteristics. I was going to say, it ties back to that behavior, doesn't it? So therefore, the provenance of the beer is a much stronger benefit because effectively you're buying into the style of the beer and where it comes from and who made it rather than necessarily what the constituent elements are of it. And again, if you look at the battle between Budweiser and Budvar, right, and the fact that, that you know, one is that they were interchangeable, but actually, they started to play on different types of hops and different types of wheat and different, you know, Bud Bar is the original, is made to the European standard of making lager, whereas Bud Weiss is made to the American standard of making lager. And, you know, depending on your taste preference, American lager doesn't taste like anything, whereas Bud Bar has a proper flavor to it because it's made entirely differently. That became a battle over the flavors and what went into it and the hops and the one was hops and one was rice and, you know, all that sort of thing. But actually, if you think about what made Bud Visor famous was getting into the personality of the brand. So, you know, the What's Up campaign and all that sort of thing, which really, you know, put Bud Visor really on. on we're not going to do it, are we, Barnaby? No, we're not going to yeah, do we're it. We're not going no. to do it. Hey, uh... Hello? <laughs> <laughs> So what's up, B? Watching the game, having a bud. True. True. Way too old to do it. But that whole campaign gave that brand a personality, and that was the benefit of it, that actually you were, if you were associated with the personality of the brand, then you must have also that personality. So a quick way to remember the difference between features and benefits is that it's not kind of what it will do for you, but more how it makes you feel. A feature is what it what it is, mm -hmm. and then a benefit is what it does for you or what it makes you feel like. I think they're both, if you're talking about a computer or something like that, you need to talk about the benefits. If you go into a computer shop, you'll see that it lists out all the, how many meg it's got and this and that and RAMs and what video card it's got and all that thing. But actually, really while you're buying a computer is to make videos or to play computer games or to store all your photos or something like that. And, that's, and they never talk about the capability of a machine from a benefits point of view, they always talk about it from a feature point of view. So actually you end up looking at it and going, oh, the price of that's 329 and it gets 40 gig. And then the one that's 299 gets 35 gig. Oh, so I'm paying for, for more gig. Actually, you, you have no idea what a gig will do, what it does. And that's, yeah. so that whole market is sold incorrect. That's sold purely on features and it doesn't work. If you've ever had the misfortune to ask somebody what the difference between one computer is and another, they tend to read the labels. And you go, yeah, no. A computer's got a the alphabet muddled up on a keyboard in the form of a QWERTY. I said, I can read, right? Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to use the keyboard on a computer. So you don't have to read the labels to me. You know, instead of saying, well, actually, what do you want it for? What's your ambition? You know, how many of X do you do? Do you do video editing? Do you do? And then you go, okay, well, this is the machine that's best for you because it's got a better graphics card or, you know, more RAM or whatever, a better connection to the internet on Wi Fi or whatever. And then you go, oh, that's the one I want. And that's a benefit led. So the second set of benefits that you need in your value properties to divine right at the beginning is what are the benefits? The third set of values you need to, to define then, having defined your behavioral style, your benefits is what you want people to believe about you after they've interacted with your brand. And, and this is inspired by one of the books behind me, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Rule number one, be proactive. Rule number two, begin with the end in mind. And when you're developing a value proposition, you must define what you want people to believe about your brand before you start creating anything for the brand. Because it gives you the judgment criteria to say, okay, when we produce this piece of communication or this packaging or the way we answer the phone or whatever, does it make the recipient of that message believe about our brand what we need them to believe? 
So you need to define that right up front. And then the final value that you really need to define is what you want to be famous for. What's the one single thing you want to be famous for? Mm -hmm. um, and you need to define that right up front because that's the real, the totem pole around which you dance, you know, with everything that you do from a brand building point of view. And again, often people don't do that. They kind of go, well, we'll see what happens. Well, that's when you see all your money just disappearing down various holes in the marketing industry because you, you haven't really defined that. So the value proposition needs to have your behavioral style defined, your benefits defined, what you want people to believe about you and what you want to be famous for. Until you've defined that, that's the one thing. If you haven't got that in place, I'm sorry to say you cannot make marketing work. You cannot build a brand. It's just not possible for 99.999% of all businesses. To me, it kind of conjures up in my mind the four pillars that you would need for good foundations in most things. And if you're going to start building on something, you need to have the best foundation. So there's a, Correct. another big Correct. word. The best. Yeah. The best. Yeah, the best. Absolutely. In fairness, from our point of view, that's still only half the story. The other thing you need to define is who your ideal prospect is. And a lot of business owners talk about demographics. Demographics is a fraud that was created by the broadcast industry way back when and ceased to have any impact on marketing uh, probably around 1995 when the internet arrived. And so we moved some 22 years ago to psychographics. So what you also need as a foundation stone is to have a psychographic profile of your ideal prospect. So in other words, how do they think? How do they feel? What's their attitude? What's their experience of your particular product set or, or your service set? What their ambitions are? And you need to define all that because that's what you're addressing in your marketing. Those that's are the benefits you're that you're going to be matching up and talking about. Correct. Right? Exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Exactly yeah. right. So then... Business just becomes about matching the psychographic profile aspirations with your value aspirations. And once you've got those two foundation stones in place, it's actually very hard to go wrong. I know it sounds ridiculous, mm. but too often I get clients walking in here and they've got mainly neither of them. They've got a sense of what their value proposition is, but they can't really define it. And they have no sense of who their ideal prospect is and are being convinced to blast their message, tell the world how amazing they are in a really crass way. And of course, that's expensive. It's slow. It's time consuming because of course you have to sort the wheat from the chaff all the time rather than just only having wheat. And, you know, so, and for the majority of businesses, this just becomes too arduous, too difficult, and they just give up. And as a result, they stall because they've got no influx of prospects. And what we do as an organization is to make sure that you've always got an influx of the right people coming in so that the energy you place into the building those relationships with those people is 100% likely to convert them. And people still don't, which is why it's, we have a bucket shape because people drop out at various parts of the, of the bucket because life throws Googlers at them. They, don't, they can't afford it or they don't like it or they discover it doesn't do quite what they want or... You know, there's lots of things. Things change. People change. People change. Things come out of our control. Yeah, yeah. And the environment's constantly fluid and changing. So if you know that everybody who's effectively coming in the top of your bucket is a really hot prospect right from the off because you've created a breadcrumb trail effectively to your value proposition based on their attitude towards you, it's very hard to go wrong. There, You lose them. There's no shame in losing them along the way because there's probably – as a result of things you have no control over. I'm guessing that that allows you the time to concentrate on the things that are important to you as well, though. Yes, very much so. Well, it declutters, doesn't it? It declutters the journey entirely. And actually, the respect you get from people who say, look, we, we've kind of reviewed what you're looking for. We're not your answer. And actually, given we understand the marketplace, this might be a better answer for you if you want to go over there. That'll get you far more business, <laughs> turning somebody down. Because they'll say, oh, I went to them and they told me it wasn't quite right, but actually they'd be brilliant for you because it is what you want. And they become a referring mechanic and all that sort of thing. So, so having that openness and honesty in your value proposition is very, very powerful and can make a huge difference to your ability to engage with and convert people who, who are looking to buy from you. We know a bit more about what you do. And of course, to get to the bottom of all of that conversation is really right at the bottom of it all. And I'm guessing that 
writing your first book and your second book, a lot of those conversations are going to come for to mind in wanting to reach as many people as you possibly can that need to read and hear that part of your journey. Is that a good sort of assessment of how you found writing about what you do? It's a great observation. The first book I wrote primarily to boost my credentials more than anything else, if I was honest with you. So at the time I started writing the book, I was running a top 200 advertising agency in central London. And I was working 17 and a half hours a day. I was working six days a week and I wasn't really making any money. And we had, you know, 35 staff. We had a big building in central Clerkenwell. And marketing was going through a massive, massive change. And so we're, we're talking 2008, 2009, 2010, which when I started writing the first book. And I'd made a decision that I would push out on my own and run a completely outsourced business, which is what I run today. So I run a business that provides exactly the same services as this big fancy agency I had that cost me a fortune, but everything's outsourced to best in class people in the various aspects. So I wanted something that when going out on my own, I had almost as a crutch more than anything else to say, look, I put the thinking into anchor. This. Yeah, I, anchor's nice. Anchor's nice, that much nicer. But I put all the thinking into this. This is the formula for marketing success, and this is what I pursue. And if you use me, then I will ensure that what's in the book. So that was the first book. And I had been asked to write it by a publisher. So I'd made a contribution to another book on, on portfolio working, and I'd written an article about how you build a personal brand using the brand bucket. And they approached me after the book was published and said, this is one of the best chapters in the book. Is there anything else to the brand bucket? And I said, well, actually, it underpins a whole agency and philosophy. And, you know, we've been developing this formula for eight years and um, he said okay is there a book in it so i wrote the book really to satisfy him to have as a, an anchor point and a, a proof of my competency without all what i thought i needed which was this infrastructure of having a fancy ad agency with studios and meeting rooms and libraries and staff and all around me because i thought that's what you needed to prove so that the book was part of that it was also a ticket to get me onto the speaking stage. So I, I'm a professional speaker. So again, it was another ticket to doing that. And that was, again, useful because you could send it to people. It's been a great tool for prospecting. So that was certainly the first book. The second book, however, is a sense that too many businesses are being missold by the marketing industry. They are doing it wrong. And I just wanted to have an opportunity to almost rant in a positive way in a second book to say, listen, guys, just look around you. What you're being asked to do by your agencies, by your marketing people, does not bear any relationship to the way people are buying. And stop and look up and look around and stop looking at what the agency is trying to peddle. Because what's happened in the marketing communication world is we this business swing to Digital agencies and the strategic agencies have kind of withered on the vine. And if you go even into the big advertising agencies that I used to work for, you know, they're just loads of kids sitting around on scatter cushions kind of coming up with crazy ideas. It's very short term. It's very immediate because the nature of a career in, in, in the advertising world and the marketing world and the digital world is you're lucky if you've lasted in a job two years. So all you've got to do is in two years is create something amazing that everybody talks about and then you move on to the next bit and the next bit. What that does, though, is it leaves a massive strategic vacuum for businesses. And when you look at the way businesses are structured and the way they're formed, they're very strategic. They're very processed, very systems, very orientated. So what we are seeing is a divergence between the way marketing thinking is going, in my opinion, and ultimately the way business thinking is going, which is becoming much more systemized, much more processed, much more AI orientated, much more about you know, building systems and processes that work for the buyers. Meanwhile, the marketing world is drifting off saying, what's the next hot thing that we're going to do? What's the next influencer? What's the next digital code that we can write? What's the next way in? And yeah, I think while, this too, in the real world, businesses don't care. They don't care. No, absolutely. And they're just wasting money on all these things. So the second book is really an attempt to, for those that are sitting there a bit uncomfortable who do care about this, business owners, it's for them to read it and go, hmm, that's interesting. That's the way we're not thinking. That does reflect the way the real world works. I can understand that. And therefore, we need to rethink our strategic intent behind our brand building rather than just hoping that lots of people buy us and it all becomes, you know, 
the talk of the town on TikTok and that'll do. That won't do. That simply won't do. Sounds to me like that needs to be brought to life as quickly as you can, really, Barnaby, yes. because <laughs> what I would, my observation is that when I wrote my book, it was to try and pass on as many of the things that were in my head that I knew worked Yes, with many people who needed that as possible. It was in my head and I'd got a lot of the content. It was It just came together so quickly. To me, it was meant to be. And I think that rather than the anchor book that you had, you've got this yeah. probe that's questioning, that's saying, yes. come on, what's, what do you think too? And I do think that there are certain aspects of any industry, not just marketing, that are very internalized and self-serving. Yes. So these questions do need to be asked and it does need to come from thought leaders like you. I think that's right. And so if I can make a tiny little contribution to just shifting people's understanding, I think that's the function of the book. And, and I, you know, I've spent a lot of time writing it and uh, I've tried to make it something that you, it's more like a, a, a strategic manual than just here's another 150 page rant about my experience and my learning and how everybody's doing it wrong, which was, has always been my, my, t- and I, when I'm on stage, I'm a bit like that. I kind of challenge the audience to say, come on guys, are you really seriously telling me that this and this, and here are some key facts, you know, and once you start to listen to the, assimilate the key facts together, then people sit there and go, that's, yeah, we're not orientating our experience as a brand anywhere towards the way people are consuming our brand or indeed any brand globally. So and then what I've done is I've then said, and this is how the bucket methodology can apply it strategically. You can apply it creatively. You can apply it from a design point of view, design it from a process point of view. So there's sort of different chapters on how the bucket has a different impact on those areas of your business. So, yeah. so it becomes kind of a practical thing as well, as well as saying things have changed and you need to embrace and, the change. And of course, strategically, I know everybody has to test and measure. That's kind of... A given, yes. right? That, you know, you put your processes in place and you test and measure everything. But I see way too often that people are in too much of a hurry to measure yes, with not very little testing. So, you know, you do have right. to give time to these things to really start to see. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a really great point. I think what people have misunderstood is that, there's testing measurement and then there's continuation measurement. And what people move to is they move to the measurement straight away and they say, well, this hasn't worked. And you go, yeah, but you've, do- you've been doing it for a month, right? You know, you, well, it hasn't worked, so we're going to stop doing it. And you go, okay, well, hold on. Let's just look at all the underlying conditions around that. You're selling ice creams and it's January. You know, okay, don't, you're not going to sell many ice creams in January. Oh, no, but we've set it all up so that we would sell ice cream. Okay, well, that's just not going to happen because... People don't eat ice cream in January, you know. Yes. But actually, if you've done equally done the test in the hottest July on record and ice cream's gone through the roof, you could build a whole business around that. And then again, that's equally wrong. So, you know, because the, 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 because of the weather. The <laughs> because of the weather, correct. And I see people doing this all the time and not spending a time. And, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna run a business and you've got, you know, a planning cycle, which could be three months, 90 days, could be six months, could be 12 months. You've got to run tests for at least that length of period so that you can rinse and repeat that on the next quarter or the next six months or whatever. And actually, in real terms, if you don't run a test for a year, you haven't really got a real true sense of how our mindsets change as we go through the year, um, mm. which as, as buyers, and you haven't got a sense of that. So you could be making really bad decisions based, in, based on measuring uh, but not testing, as you rightly point out. So and I, I think agree. this is where A and B, is that what they call it these days? A yeah, and B. Split testing, split testing. Split that's testing. Right, yeah. That's yeah. got to be something. Because in January, if you're moving all your effort and energy into building momentum for the warmer months, then you yes. will get the reward later. But then, of course, in July, when you're selling loads and loads of ice cream, that momentum will fall away. So what are you going to do to replace that momentum? It just means vertical markets and different Yeah, different uses. And, and exactly. And have fun with it. I think the other thing is that the short-termism that's brought in by the stock exchange and by the economy, and I've also observed that everybody's rushing to make a buck quickly without any sense of actually, let's look at this as a year-long program or a five-year plan or something like that. And let's make the money when, you know, make hay. You know, if you go back to the harvest, 
if it's dry and sunny, you're going to go and crop your fields. You're going to stay up all night, work all night, and then you're going to, you know, and, and get it done. Because you know that if it rains, the crop's going to get ruined. If you don't get it in in time, it's going to get ruined, et cetera, et cetera. So, so but you then store the crop so that you can eat during the winter months, you know. Yeah. You it's, know and it's, it's that sacrifice of, well, it might be a nice day. Oh, I can't do the things that I really want to do today because I've got to work. Yeah. That's part of the gig, isn't it? That you've got I, to, I guess you've got to yeah. put that effort in when that effort is required. But as long as you then go, don't go out and buy a fast car or a, or a, or a bigger house at the end of that period. A bigger combine harvester. A bigger combine harvester. Yes, exactly. <laughs> when you don't actually need one. And because you know that in the winter months, it's going to be fallow. So there's going to be no income. So you spread the income out. And again, I, I see businesses making snap decisions, spending a lot of money, making hay. And then suddenly three months later, coming back, saying we haven't got any business anymore. You go, no, okay, that's okay. Because you've got made all that money last uh, in the last quarter. And they go, no, we've spent all that. And you go, okay, what did you spend it on? Ah, uh, well, we spent it on ourselves. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, well, now you're going to have to starve then while you were eating out in the fancy restaurants, you know? <laughs> it's, you yes. Know. Are you a budding entrepreneur or just starting out? Well, maybe this podcast is just for you. I'm Anna Flockett, editor of Startups Magazine, and our podcast, The Serial Entrepreneur, brings you stories, journeys, and lessons from some of the most inspirational startups and business founders out there. Talking to these innovative startups, we delve deep into some of the challenges they face, lessons they've learned along the way, with a sprinkling of inspirational advice. You can find us by searching The Serial Entrepreneur, as in your breakfast cereal, into any streaming service or by going to startupsmagazine.co.uk. We don't talk enough about the financing behind the business, and it is very much like a heartbeat. You know, there are times where uh, I can certainly look back over the 16 years of running my business where it's been like a flat line, you know, bring out the pads to inject some energy into the body of it. And then there have been highs, you know, where just before COVID hit, that it was my best financial quarter ever. But it goes up and it goes down. There's no one line, you know, that just sits like a flat line. I think there is a flat line, which is the planning line. Mm. So if, if you said, actually, look, I take a, a random figure. So you, you, you generate, you know, ten thousand pounds a month in turnover terms. If one month you make twenty, right, that's going to make up for the one month where you make nothing. And what that does is it liberates you as long as you think about it as actually, I'm my target, my flat line is ten. But this month I made thirteen, and last month I made eight, and the month next month's looking like I might make fifteen, and then the month after that might I might only make five because I'm going on holiday. For yeah, the mean average and, works. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so you so you average you do an average flat line. The way I run my business, I do exactly like that, so that I'm always at maximum energy. Because when I'm doing when I'm in a month where the income is known to be lower for whatever reason, I've taken on projects and they're still running through and all that sort of thing. I don't worry about it because I know that month has already been paid for by a previous month. So therefore, my energy in that, I don't panic, I don't do anything, I just see it drop below the average line. And then you go, okay, and I'm going to maybe just turn up the new business machine a little bit harder and do a little bit more networking or whatever. But you go in with a very positive mindset because you flatline the average. Now, clearly, if that is on a continual decline over time, then that's a challenge. But what actually happens is you become more confident. You suddenly find that flatline is going up all of the time. It may be very gently inclined. So, you know, year on year, you suddenly find actually my flatline, it, was, it wasn't 10 like it was last year it's now 11 or it's yeah you know, and next year it looks like it's going to be 12 and then suddenly your lifestyle reaches a tipping point where it can fundamentally change because your energy is always on that flat line effectively and it's exactly how harvest work and how agriculture works and many industries so yeah any seasonal business needs to think like that and i think you're right because when you're a smaller business you're the limiting resource if the resource is being used up by making money you know further down the line you're not going to have business coming in because you're not spending any time on your business. So, again, I teach all the businesses I work with that time comes in three packets. A third of your time is delivering what you do to your buyers. A third of your time is the admin supporting that delivery. And a third of your time is new business. 
Um, you must spend a, t- a third of your time on your business. So I keep timesheets. I was pulling out just before we came on the call and I get, I analyze them every week to make sure that I haven't swung too far one way and too far the other way. Because of course, if you're making hay while the sun shines, the chances are you're letting your admin slip and definitely your new business falls off first, then your admin slips. And so therefore you, you, your VAT return looms you've got a shoebox full of receipts that you haven't analyzed and everything, and you're spending three nights in a row trying to do your VAT return. Well, that's your admin catching up with your delivery and you're certainly too tired to go out. And then you wake up in the morning and go, oh, I was meant to go networking this morning for a networking breakfast and you go, oh, I can't be bothered. I was up last night doing the slips in my shoebox. And then it all just fall, un- unravels, the whole thing unravels. So I'm really clear when I'm working with businesses to say, make sure you monitor your time. You only deliver a third of your time to clients a third of the time is the admin supporting that and the third is new business do not deviate from that so i i have a, a board meeting with myself every year so i write a 10-page board report and then i sit down for two hours and go through it and on it has got a chart which shows how much time i've spent on client delivery admin and new business honestly when it, it always aligns with the success of the business always if i've let new business drift out the turnover drops it's a really good point barnaby because you know it's like when you hear people say, oh gosh, it's it's going to be Christmas soon. Like it's at the same time every year. Yes. <laughs> you know, it, it, why is it such a surprise? Or, oh, the kids are going to have six weeks off and what am I going to do with the time? Well, that's where you plan for these things. Exactly. So exactly. if you can be one step ahead, always you're going to win. Yeah. 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 I think that's right. So it's all in the planning. And I think that's, you're right. It's about measuring. It's about testing. It's about what, managing the finances. They facilitate your brand and then having a strong value proposition, strong target market, and then having a methodology of bringing those two, two together. I, I use this brand bucket methodology. There are lots of ways of doing that. And uh, then I think you really do have a formula for a successful business. The first B words, that behavior underpins everything then, doesn't it? Because if yeah. you're going to be dragged down by your time and your planning, then your behavior is affected, then the people that you attract are affected. Yeah. And people mistakenly describe that as empathy or, or something like that. But actually, when people are buying things from you, they're buying optimism, they're buying hope, they're buying the future, they're buying all that sort of thing. They don't want, they don't actually want empathy to say, yeah, I, I understand what it's like to not have any money because I haven't got any either at the moment. Okay. Well, that's, I'm not sure I want to do business with you. <laughs> Just, <laughs> yes. The wrong match. It's the wrong match up. And, and, that, and it ties in nicely <laughs> that, that belief, you need to believe in yourself before you Correct. can allow any, before anybody else will allow themselves to believe in you too. Yes, you know, absolutely. Because ultimately your family and your friends will always believe in you, whether that's misplaced or not, is, an, yeah. is for another conversation. But I think it is something that you do have to look and believe in yourself. Definitely. Yeah, very much so. And actually, one of the challenges if you if you're the mainstay in your business, so and for, for you know, ninety five point six percent of all businesses, the business owner is the mainstay on that, you know, because that's characterizes all businesses under ten people, ten employed people, and so therefore there's probably just the one main founder who's the epicenter of the business. Often when people come into my office and start to take on the brand bucket program, by externalizing their values into a value proposition that sits in the business. It allows them to do what is a common phrase is to stop working in the business and start working on the business because you've extrapolated the values that are within the, the founder and you've placed them into the business because they it tend makes, to be one and makes, the same. It makes it very real as well, doesn't it? Yeah. Because yeah. there's a reference point. It's not just a wishy-washy idea that you had and you may need to jog your memory on occasionally. Yes. Why am I doing this? Why is my why? Well, you, you know that because you've established it. Yeah. yeah. And in fairness, I'm not a big fan of Simon Sinek's Start With Why. Uh, I think it was when it was published in 2009, it was a great summary of the previous 10 years of what we'd seen in the agency and how brands were being created. I think it, it's had a, a profoundly damaging effect on the mindset of many business owners, starting with why, because it's almost like if they get that, then that's all they have to do. I've discovered my why, I've discovered my purpose. Well, all of that's great, but it's only meaningful to you as the business owner. It's not really meaningful to the outside world. Mm-hmm. And one of the one of the flaws in that piece of thinking is it doesn't translate into a messaging and a brand and an experience, and a systems and process, however you want to narrate it, for buyers. 
the people who are going to give you money to sustain your purpose. And it's been very damaging. I have a lot of people walk in and say, oh, yeah, we've, we've defined our why. And I go, so why are you here? And they go, because it doesn't really work. <laughs> I go, no, because <laughs> you know why you're going to work and I don't care. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. you, you, you've blasted me with features and your website's covered in features and this and that and all that sort of thing. And it really is your version of your why and everything. But actually, I've got my own personal why and it doesn't bear any relationship to yours. So therefore, good luck and enjoy your life, you know, and... So there's a real risk associated around around the start with why philosophy. And and actually, if you look at the brands that have emerged in the last 10 years or so, none of them have a why. Bezos is getting a lot of criticism, you know, for, for setting up one of the most fantastic business models possible in, in, in Amazon. His why wasn't what it is now, you know, and certainly I wouldn't buy into his why. I, I wouldn't want to fly into Scotland in a 48 million pound jet you know, during uh, on the day one of COP26. I mean, that just the disconnect between what Bezos is doing and sending people up in rockets for 10 minutes and sending them back down there, the disconnect between that and what our real planetary challenges are right now is so profound that it's it's almost scary. And yet he's got all the wealth, all the power to do something about it. And it's completely counterintuitive. So his why I don't relate to in any shape or form, but I love Amazon. <laughs> I just think it's really cool. You know, I can go on and order something that'll be here this afternoon. I think mean, it's just brilliant. I think as a business model, it's brilliant. So I think you have to be really careful with that. What they've done though is they built a, an experience around me. That's why Amazon's so successful. That's why eBay's so successful. It's why Deliveroo's so successful. It's why Expedia's so successful. It's, you know, that all of the all the brands that have emerged, the whole Uber mindset, that, that all of that. It's all emerged because all of those brands are built around my experience, how I want to buy things. And it's much more about how now than it is why. It's, you know, how do you make a difference to people's lives? How do you make it easy to buy from you? How do you, and this should all be in your value proposition. And so the whole why thing, I think, is very misleading. And I feel desperately sorry for people who have found this. They'll stick to that wicked. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, uh, I would say that, you know, you've taken me back to a television program that I used to love as a kid. I'm going to really reveal my age now. And it was called How. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> How. What's it? So a question, a question for you, because I think we're, I need to get on to this pivotal conversation part. What do you want to be famous for then, Barnaby? I want to create a world where all brands matter. So my methodology so that's my vision so my my strategy for doing that is to help as many people as i can reach understand the thinking behind the brand bucket and therefore enable them to perceive the world of building business and brands in an entirely sensible strategic way so that i want to be famous for the bucket I think I've been successful at that over the last 20 years. I think I think people know me as Mr. Bucket and things like that, and that's fine. Not bouquet. You know, well, <laughs> some people have said that, to be fair. But then that, that's also showing your age because that's from another... Oh, dear, oh, dear. Oh, <laughs> dear. Years ago. Uh, and I'm known for a lot of other things as well. So I'd like to be famous for that. I see myself much more as the civil service than the MP, though. So where I get my fame from is seeing a Marie Curie daffodil or seeing a can of red stripe or seeing people listening to Classic FM or, you know, all the brands that I've helped make famous. And you see That's, it in people's lives. And you see it in people's lives and you see the quality of their life just a little chink better than it was before their interaction with those Oh, brands. it's like product placement. Yeah, it's a bit like that. It's a bit like that. Yeah. I've launched over 447 brands worldwide. So it's always exciting to go around and seeing how you've impacted on the quality of people's lives in some shape or form. And so I, I think the fame is literally just knowing that I've done that and I've made a contribution to that. Not alone, obviously with teams of people, but, you know, I've led that. And that is enough for me. And then obviously be a great husband and a great father. I mean, I think those will do me, to be honest. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the celebrity side of fame is not really my thing so legacy is the word. Mm, okay, so part of okay, what you've so, been influential over will still be here. Yeah, so I'm a living legacy fan, not a legacy fan, on the grounds that 
I don't think I'm around for the legacy part, <laughs> whereas I like being around for the living legacy. So I don't particularly merit life after death in that sense from a legacy point of view. I think your responsibility is when you're Whilst alive you're here. Yes. Yeah, to impact everybody around you when you're alive. So the concept of legacy is not in my field of vision, but living legacy, definitely. And that's just another phrase for making sure that everybody you engage with feels the moment, you're in the moment, you're making a difference as best you can. You're doing unto others what as you would have done. I sound almost religious. I'm a complete atheist. So, so it's, you know, I sound almost religious when I talk like this, but I think that kind of philosophy of if you get a chance to make a difference, make a difference right there and then. Don't say, well, what I'm going to do is build something that makes a difference after I've gone. I agree with you 150%. <laughs> it's just, I don't know. I don't know. It makes me sound odd when I think when I talk like this, but I think it's, that's what it's about. Make it count. Make it count right now. And if, you know, whatever your individual perspective is on the world, whether you're climate, whether you're mental health, whether you're diversity, whether you're business, whether you're you know, family, it doesn't really matter. Just make a difference in those areas whilst you can and when you're able. And I've, I've found that to be a very rewarding way of, of going through life, to be honest. Making conversations count, you see, Barnaby. Yes, indeed. Absolutely right. Absolutely <laughs> right. Very much so. Very much so. Your next book is turning those conversations into actions, of course. Then. That's, the, <laughs> that's the next well, book. And that's the thing, isn't it? Is the, the conversations are meant to inspire and to get yeah. people thinking. And really, it's then about taking action, isn't it? Because nothing will be without action. And that's what I would always look to try and influence is that people are at least taking some action because that is better than none. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, actually, I don't think it matters whether it's a good action or a bad action. I mean, I think obviously you don't want to actively do bad work, but if, if you take an action, it doesn't go as well as you thought, for example, let's put it that way rather than bad action. I think it's your part of your, what you were talking about is about your testing and measuring that barometer is always applied because then if you do something and you go, I think it's going to have this impact. So I'll begin with the end in mind and it's going to have this impact. And it didn't. Well, you know then how to not do it, not not do it that way again, and you can improve it and get better and get better. So failing is a key part of of growth and development and all that sort of thing. So do something and don't be stressed if you fail. Just go, okay, right, I wouldn't do it that way again, and the next time it'll be better. I think it's a good philosophy to have, and you know, a conversation is a great start point for that, of course. The blueprint for confident conversations over the telephone is here. Take advantage of my 30 years, two recessions and navigating a pandemic to transform your business in my 12-week programme. Together, I will show you my 4R formula where we will frame your solution, sell your story, qualify new clients, follow up inquiries and build your audience, all centred through confident conversations. Let's face that fear of rejection together grow your business for a much better life. If you're ready to make a start, quote, make my conversations count in an email, send it to wendy at wagassociates.com. It's time to ask you about your conversation that counted. And everybody gets to bring one along and I have no clue what's coming next. So Barnaby, would you like to just share with us what that was all about? Yes. So I enjoyed a very accelerated career in in, in advertising. I did psychology as a degree, went straight into the advertising industry after doing a postgraduate qualification in psychology and a postgrad in in advertising, postgrad in marketing. Went straight into the advertising industry and, and raced through a couple of agencies until I was working in an agency in Soho with what was called another advertising agency uh, or or what was called a below the line agency. So they did all the promotions. They said, do you fancy coming to lunch one day? And I I went to lunch with them. They said, look, would you ever think of joining us? And I said, well, I'm a fancy damn brand guy. You know, I was well suited, took caps everywhere, you know, had bags, people carrying them and stuff like that. And they used to go with a big idea. I said, I don't really do what you do. I don't do promotions and brochures and websites and uh, don't do all that sort of stuff really and they said oh yes you do and I said no I don't and they said no we've seen you in meetings and you know how ideas can happen at every single touch point we've watched you do it and I go oh that's not really me that's my current creative director's talking and they said no no we watch you do it 
will you come and have a conversation with a gentleman called Stuart Ball? And I said, well, okay, whatever. So I received an invite to a dinner at the Groucho Club. Uh, and I, I hadn't really been to the Groucho Club. So I arrived up there and said, hello, my name's Mr. And they said, oh, Barnaby, yes, please follow us. So I'm led from the reception, as was then in the Groucho Club, through the main bar where there's all these famous people drinking. And I'm kind of recognized a few of them off the telly. And I'm thinking, and I'm shown to a private room where this gentleman called Stuart Ball was sat and he stood up and said, oh, I'm so glad you could come. I've heard all about you. And he was the owner of this agency. And he, he said, look, thank you for coming. I, I just, I want to show you something. And he drew the brown bucket on a piece of paper in front of me. We ordered drinks and he just drew this, uh, drew this thing and explained how it worked and all that sort of thing. And this, the brown bucket six steps was something he'd first created for Saab in 1985 and had used it to build a massive advertising agency, which he'd sold to Saatchi and Saatchi. And they, being Saatchi and Saatchi, didn't want his brand bucket methodology, his strategic. So he removed it from the deal and took it and started this agency that he was now running and I was sitting in front of it. As he went through this, my jaw literally fell from the top part of my face to the floor. And I just sat there and after he'd finished, I said, that is just so clever. And he said, yes, we thought you'd like it. And then he explained the history of it and all that sort of thing and how they'd used it on over 4,000 brands and, and Tuberg and Carlsberg and all those, all these ones that they did in the AA and SO and all this sort of thing to help them build their brand presences in the marketplace. He said, I'm 57. I'm looking for a successor and blah, blah. We'd like to, you know, you to think about that. And so we discussed what the agency was about. He'd set up this agency called the communication unit. It's the first ever. UK agency that did everything across the marketing mix in one agency using this brand bucket methodology. He founded it in 95 and we were now in, in, in 1999. So they'd been running for a while and they had been approached by a brand called E-Trade, an American brand, little tiny brand in America to launch them in Europe and help them build them their, their franchise in, in America. He knew I had a load of internet experience and I was, I was quite keen on all that sort of thing. He said, we'd love you to, to join us. And I said, well, what, you know, what would you pay? And blah, blah, blah. And anyway, at the end of this conversation, I agreed a salary. I'd agreed to the perks. I'd agreed I would join the agency. And that, that was that. And so I left, I left that conversation, went and resigned. And the agency I was in, I was quite senior. So I had a six month notice period on this. And three weeks before the notice period was due to expire. So that's five and a half months later. I still hadn't had a contract from Stuart and the rest of the team. Anyway, it, it, it arrived. And it arrived at my house in Seven Oaks. And my wife shouted down and says, Is that the contract? And I said, Yeah, because she was obviously very nervous. I owned it. Bridge it? between said, yeah. one paycheck and the next. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It was about to drop off a cliff, the whole, whole lifestyle. It said, Barnaby went to managing director. And I said, Oh, it says Barnaby went to managing director. And, and Jill Robinson, who was the managing director of this agency, had also been part of the interview process and everything. And in fact, ran the account that I'd been present in. And, uh, I said, oh, it says Barnaby went to, she said, oh, you're going to be managing director. I said, I have to tell you, I've never asked what job I was going to do. Because <laughs> <laughs> the conversation had been so overwhelming that night. I would actually never asked what job I was going to do. And so I'd gone through this whole process. And he said, well, isn't Jill the MD? And I said, yeah. So anyway, you can't sign it. They might have made a mistake. So I rang Jill and I said, I've got the contract. She says, so sorry, lawyers. We've never done it as anybody as senior as this before and blah, blah, all, all the stuff. She said, and I said, yeah, the Barnaby went to manage an director one. She said, yeah, yeah. And I went, yeah, 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 great. So put the phone down, signed this document and realized that in the next three weeks, I was going to become manager director of a top 200 agency and turned out to be the youngest MND of a top 200 agency in the UK for three months until the next young kid came along, I guess. But uh, campaign were there and they interviewed me when I arrived and all that sort of thing. You're the youngest MD, you know, how do you do it? All this sort of thing. All around from this one conversation with Stuart. And what that conversation really pivoted for me, I think at the time was, we talked earlier about how well read I am. I was really well read then. I'd read lots of books. I had loads of systems and processes and the way you did things. And I, I did psychology as in the science faculty. So I'm very logic orientated. I want it all to work. I want it all to plug together and all that sort of thing. And I'd, I'd worked on the four tiers that Ford had created and then the thumbprint of another agency. And so, so I loved all these kind of models. So what happened in that conversation was somehow everything kind of converged, but all together in one thing, just in this one conversation. 
And from that point on, all I've thought about is this brand bucket six steps. So it's now, you know, what's that? 22 years now, solidly every day. All I do is talk about this. And it's all from that one conversation where Stuart presented his, and bear in mind, he'd, he'd been leveraging it for, for 14 years, you know, so, so he was very well versed on it. And I took it on and took the bat on and all that sort of thing. I ended up buying the agency from them after 18 months and starting to run it on my own from 2001 onwards. And about six years later, he, he was walking past the office in Clerkenwell and he knocked on the door and came in and said, there's a Barnaby around. I was there and I just dropped everything and we went, I showed him around the agency. I said, we've done this and we've done that and we've done this and we've created this and we've done that. And I said, look what we've done with your brand bucket. And he just stopped me in the corridor. He just, and he just turned and he said, Barnaby, this is not my brand bucket anymore. This is your brand bucket. What you have done in the last eight years, he said, there's no relation to the thing that I sold to you. So it's much more robust. It's much cleverer. It's much more of the market. It was almost the closure on that conversation that we'd had in Groucho. So this is almost a, a one conversation that took over eight years. And he just closed it off and he, just, he said, look, and I said, no, it is. And he said, no, 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 no. I didn't have that and I didn't have that. And we hadn't interpreted it like that. And we hadn't done that. And we hadn't got that case study. And we hadn't, all the things you've just shown me. We didn't have any of that when you took this on from me. He said, you've moved it to something that's a mainstay of all the hundreds of businesses you're working with now. We didn't have it as that. We had it as a planning tool that influenced the creative work in my agencies. This is now a mainstay of how businesses should think and, and how they should approach their brand strategically. So that conversation for me is head and shoulders about it, above any other conversation I've ever had, that one in Groucho, because it shaped my whole lifetime from a business perspective and probably made me who I am as well because I live and breathe my work. I don't make a distinction between work life and private life. It's just my life. So this is my life now. And I absolutely revel in the opportunity to share that conversation that I had with Stuart in Groucho with as many people as I possibly can. <laughs> <laughs> what a fabulous conversation and a good reminder that as what we were talking about earlier is that that test and measure that, you know, a month isn't long enough. Clearly no. that conversation needed eight years to get to maturity. And those sorts of journeys are the journeys that are worth embarking on. And so therefore, I think that pivotal conversation has got, it had many dimensions to it. You know, it was the right time. It was the consolidation of what my life had been as a business person prior to that. It also had, it had future in it. It had a future pace in it. So that was really important as well. So it was an instrumental conversation and it created, it was almost a catalyst for the movement in my life. And it was a catalyst conversation. So, it, it, you know, the conversation remains unchanged, but the, the, the guy that walked into Groucho and walked out Groucho was an entirely different person. And then it remained the catalyst for all my, my life activities going on from there. Oh, and I'm so glad you've shared it and everything else that you've shared today. You know, your value proposition, your four Bs, about failing, about living legacy, your book recommendations. Barnaby, it's been absolutely wonderful to speak to you. Thank you so much for sharing all of your wisdom and expertise with us today. You've really given us a lot to think about. If people Good. want to carry on the conversation, where's the best place for them to find you? Best place is LinkedIn. So to connect to me via LinkedIn, that's got all my history, my background. You can see if I'm real or not. Barnaby Winter with a Y, just to make things awkward if you type that in. In fact, if you Google Barnaby Winter, you should. Uh, there is one other young musician who's not me. But other than that, I'm, I think I'm the only one on. on I, I think if they Google Barnaby Winter and book it, they'll definitely yes, I think, find yeah. you. <laughs> I think they will find me. Undoubtedly, they will find me. There's plenty on that. And, you know, by all means, Connect with me on LinkedIn. I'll, I'll answer any questions. I'll uh, pick up, happy to have any conversations. I enjoy coffee and cake a lot. So therefore, that's how I maintain my physique. And yeah, <laughs> just just make contact. I'm happy to help uh, in any way I can and point you in, in a direction that will help your business work better and be a stronger brand. Wow. So many things to take away there. I do hope that you're taking notes and anybody that you can think of that needs help in this particular topic, please do share with them. We'd love to hear how you get on. Just having a think about those four Bs. Get in touch. Let us know. It'd be great to be able to let Barnaby hear 
some of your feedback too. He's got a book out. You'll find the details on the website. But in the meantime, gosh, thank you so much for continuing to listen. And we'll look forward to seeing you on next episode with my good friend, Gary Outrageous. I found out that I could actually show salespeople how to use hypnosis to increase their sales by accident. (laughs) 